Howdy folks, Dr. Will Wong here. Let's talk about the thing that is probably the most dangerous thing to your life. Let's talk about fibrosis and how it's the enemy of life. That's a pretty heavy title, but what is fibrosis? Fibrosis can be found in many forms. In women, it can manifest as the estrogen-driven diseases of fibrocystic breast disease, uterine fibroids, endometriosis, and ovarian cysts. It can also be found postoperatively in the lymphedema had after mastectomy as the fibrin clogs the lymphatic drainage channels and thickens the lymphatic fluid. In both sexes, fibrosis forms the postoperative scar tissue that binds the intestines or restricts the range of motion of a limb or joint and forms thickened scars and keloids, marring cosmetic surgery. Fibrosis develops in your arteries and forms the framework around which arterial sclerotic plaque builds. In COPD, emphysema, asthmatic and chronic bronchitis patients grow fibrosis as scar tissue, as a spider web inside the lungs, restricting the expansion of the lungs and clogging the alveolar sacs to prevent oxygen transfer into the blood. In men, fibrosis grows into the micro blood supply and spongy tissue of the penis, restricting blood flow and full expansion during erection. This is the main reason why erection size diminishes with age. In other estrogen-driven diseases, fibromyalgia, fibrosis grows in and between the muscle bundles, choking off their blood supply, just like putting rubber bands around your wrist and cuts off the blood supply to the hand. Along with this, the microcirculation gets clogged with fibrin plugs, which further decreases blood supply. And while without adequate oxygenated blood or blood sugar, the tissues develop the intractable pain of ischemia. Pain meds, even opiates, cannot take away ischemic pain. We know that holds true for heart attack patients, and it holds true for true fibromyalgia patients. And I have to say here, that 60% of fibromyalgia patients have been misdiagnosed and they don't really have fibromyalgia, but that's a story for another day. In all of us, as we age after 27, fibrosis grows inside of our internal organs, diminishing their size, and with that shrinkage comes a diminution in function. Med school anatomy teaches that this lowering of function is ultimately what leads us to dying and the, as the organs fail due to weakness. All of this leads to the question, why does it all seem to start after 27? Good thing to ask. Titan's medical physiology textbook tells us that old age begins at 27, but never told us why. It took Dr. Max Wolf and Dr. Carl Ronsberger of Mucos Pharma to tell us why. After 27, the production of proteolytic enzymes drops. We make a finite amount of enzymes in a lifetime and use about half of them by the time we're 25. That's the reason why young folks, though they make cancer cells on the first day of life, usually don't develop that and most any other conditions mentioned. As they have an adequate supply of proteolytic enzymes that they make to keep all those things in check. It's after our supply of proteolytic enzymes drops that needs to be spread throughout the rest of our lifetimes, that we begin to develop the fibrosis conditions. For you docs out there, here's my contention, that if we measure a premorbid state by taking measures of proteolytic enzymes, just as we can predict death within three days by measuring levels of dopamine, we'll be able to predict death within three or four days by measuring the uh, amounts of proteolytic enzymes made by the body. Enzymes are biocatalysts. The four or five enzymes that we make or eat create seven to 35,000 enzymatic reactions that speed up those chemical reactions and keep us from taking 15 minutes to blink our eyelids or 30 minutes to bend our elbows. So from the day we make our last drop of proteolytic enzymes, death should ensue within three to four days. If we can deal with the laying down of fibrosis as efficiently as we did back when we were youngsters, then we would avoid or reduce much of what is trying to shorten our lives or at least make us sick and less able. 
Remember back when you were younger how well wounds healed with a strong, pliable, invisible scar. And then think about how lumpy, bumpy, and full of keloids that same wound healed with after 40 or 50. Those who've read my article, The Essentials of Life and Wellness, on my drwongsmessage.com site, know where I'm going from here. The most important thing to put back into any aging body are not vitamins and minerals, not herbs, not the growth hormones, but enzymes. The proteolytic enzymes. Vitamins and minerals are more properly named coenzymes and cofactors. In other words, they are things that help enzymes to work. If the enzymes aren't there to begin with, the vitamins and minerals have little or no function because they've got nothing to latch onto to do what they're supposed to do with the enzyme. The reason why vitamin and mineral supplementation works so well for some and doesn't do squat for others is that they have little enzymes that the vitamins and minerals need to work with. If we put in the primary protein-eating enzymes and the body will cause the enzyme cascade, creating thousands of new enzymes from the original four or five. Everything else we do in regards to nutrition and exercise works better once we put the enzymes back into our bodies in significant amounts. Now, as regards fibrin, all proteolytic enzymes eat away at fibrin, fibrinolysis to some degree, but some are considerably stronger than others. If the proteolytic enzymes you put back into your body are super highly fibrinolytic, then it will eat away, lice away, the fibrosis your body is trying to build in your lungs, in your kidneys, in your liver, on your joints, between your vertebra, in your eyes, on your eyes. This is a secret that plastic surgeons, pulmonologists, internists, are beginning to learn. The fibrin that is supposed to be there is marked by the body as endogenous and belonging there and is not bothered by the enzymes. But the fibrin that forms scar tissue is marked as an exogenous protein and the enzymes eat those. Remember, excess fibrin equals a weak structure, not leaving enough space for epithelial tissue to grow through through the fibrin matrix. It equals restriction of range of motion as regards to joints and muscles. It equals diminution in size and function of the internal organs. And that's the secret behind enzymes' ability to go after what is extra and leave behind what is needed for structure, just as it did in wound healing when you were a kid. A major step towards a better quality of life, higher levels of health and attainment of wellness is the removal of excess fibrin from our bodies. Don't let it gunk up your blood. Don't let it restrict your range of motion. Don't let it clog up your internal organs. Let's get back to the enzyme levels we had when we were healthy, young, strong teenagers. And on that note, I'll leave you now and chat with you again next time. Be well. God bless. Thank you for joining Dr. Wong this evening for the Essentials of Life and Wellness. If you have any questions about this show or if you want to ask Dr. Wong any health-related questions, you may email those questions to him directly at askdrwong at drwongsessentials.com. The products Dr. Wong recommends can be found online at drwongsessentials.com or you can speak with a customer service representative at 866 268 3216. Dr. Wong also has an extensive natural health website written in Dr. Wong's unique and easy to understand style that discusses remedies for some of today's most debilitating and chronic conditions. Those those are at drwong.us. Dr. Wong's lecture and podcast from 2007 through 2016 can be heard at drwongradio.com. His podcasts since 2016 and his lecture, Fighting the Things Most Likely to Kill Us, can be found on YouTube by searching for Dr. William Wong's Essentials of Life and Wellness. Until next time, we hope you have a safe and healthy week. Be well and God bless.